grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, from him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are in part three of our Hebrews series, yesterday and today and forever. Today we talk about a rest for God's people. This is from Hebrews chapter 3, 7 through 4, 13. And just to say what else is on the slide, this is being delivered on July 21st, 2024. Next week... After service, we will have our first Navigating Hebrews, where we will just sit and talk a little bit more about what we've experienced as we've been reading it. And I hope you have read it with us. If you haven't, you can catch up pretty quick. Um, Hebrews is a book that could be read in an evening, uh, but continuing to study it uh, throughout the summer, hopefully, is a can be a blessing for you as we go through this. So uh, next week, and uh, lunch and child care is provided. We'll just kind of hang out and fill up the space wherever we need to and, uh, and visit. Ask uh, what will be questions, answers, thoughts, commentary, whatever. But I'm looking forward to that blessed time. What we should see in Hebrews as we read this is Hebrews is really kind of a It helps unlock Scripture in a lot of ways. And not to say it's like the one book that that was its purpose, but because of who it's being written to. And we're going to start, on week one, we kind of talked about how we don't really know who the author is. We don't really know who the recipients were. We just have some clues about these things. But as we move forward from this point on, we're really going to start seeing um, how this was written probably to Jewish people, uh, Jewish Christians, uh, because, who knew their Old Testament well, and who were... There's a warning that keeps happening in Hebrews about not straying, and we get an indication that it's maybe a desire uh, uh, for whatever reason that, we're, that the Jews that are being written to are kind of forgetting what Jesus has done and kind of stepping back into these older traditions. But because of that purpose and and who it's being written to, what we find in this book is a lot of Old Testament being explained in the light of Christ, which is what Jesus did with his disciples. It's this isn't the only time this is talked about. Jesus sat his disciples down, and, he, and he, he said it in other places as well, but after he was resurrected, he had a moment of teaching where he walked his disciples through the Scriptures, and the Scriptures at that time would have been what we know as the Old Testament. He said, this is all about me. So Hebrews really kind of helps us unlock a lot of things that are hard to understand about Scripture because it's bringing Old Testament and New Testament together. Act 1, yesterday. So let's be reminded of what happened before. This is the story, this is kind of the big story of God's people. One of the biggest events in their history, uh, in the history of Israel. Moses is called at the burning bush to go and lead God's people, the Israelites, out of slavery in Egypt. And we hear of the ten plagues. That's what it takes for Pharaoh to finally let the people go. And then one of the first things that happens as they're leaving is, as they're escaping, they cross the Red Sea. Moses parts the waters. God parts the waters through Moses, and they cross. And then the waters come down on the Egyptians, so they're safe. And then they are directed to Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, where they receive the law. They receive the Ten Commandments. And not just the Ten Commandments, but the whole the, the covenant relationship that God now has with His people. I rescued you. You are mine. Now this is how you live. And he sends them. You are now going back 
to the land you came. This is the promised land that you are going to travel to. And what happens is they get there, they go directly there, but then they get scared because spies go and they see giants. Not, no, not those giants. Giants! Arrgh! I'm not sure if that's how their teeth looked or not. But they're scared and they don't want to go in. They don't trust God. They're fearful about going into the promised land. The consequence is wandering. And that's when we get this just walking in a circle through the wilderness. Really going nowhere. Because they were at the promised land. And then they had to walk. And they would go here and here and here until finally God brought them back. And the reason they had to wander so long is because God said, those of you except for two, Joshua and Caleb, the two spies that said, who came back and said, no, we should go, let's trust the Lord. Those are the only two people living at that time who got to go into the promised land. The wandering was so that that generation could die. That was God's judgment. Until they all died, Israel could not go to the promised land. So they're on their way, wandering, and they complain that they don't have water. So God provides water from a rock. They complain that they don't have food. God provides quail and manna. Of course, they, can, they eventually complain about those things too because... It's not a buffet. To the point that God sends serpents. People are dying, but God provides rescue. He has Moses lift up the bronze serpent, and anyone who looks at it is healed. And the wonderful parallel, Jesus even references this. Just as the serpent was lifted up in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Jesus makes the connection that this is a shadow of what He will do to provide ultimate healing from death as a consequence of sin. So the writer of Hebrews now is, is going to quote Psalm 95. And, but he's going to start making this connection. You, you know this psalm had been written centuries before, and it references the Israelites, but he's going to start bringing it into, okay, yes, that was for them, but you're going to find out that it's for us today. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. Where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now, this psalm is anonymous. But if you look it up, it's Psalm 95. It's almost word for word. But the writer of Hebrews, which there's so much theology and doctrine in this book, what does he attribute it to? As the Holy Spirit says. That this psalm was written by a person physically. but It's the Holy Spirit inspiring the words of that psalm. And why? Because it's not just for that time. It's for all time. It's God's living word that is for us today. Act 2, today. The writer continues, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. And understand, as, as we're experiencing this, as we're studying it, the writer is, again, we, we see he's writing to Jews. And he's saying, you know your history. 
God has done amazing things, but don't, re- don't forget how much rebellion there is in our history. Don't now you start falling back into those ways. You have a Savior. You know this Savior. Because he's, this is, I mean, he's talked you know, in the previous chapters. They know Jesus. He's been talking about Jesus. Like, don't forget where your salvation is and fall back into the traditions of these people that weren't perfect, who didn't get it right, who continued to rebel. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. And God's Word is alive. Quoting Psalms, Old Testament, the hymn book, but then quoting it now after Christ and applying it to today, speaking in these years of the early church. But we hear these words the same today. They touch our hearts. For we have come to share in Christ. If indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end, hold on to the confidence we have in Christ, the devil is going to be knocking at that. Hold on to the peace that we have in Jesus because he is the victor. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt by Moses? Moses is the guy. And if you remember, we we didn't really spend a lot of time on it, but prior to this, the writer had said how Jesus is greater than Moses. Well, Moses is the Jewish hero, and he really is the biggest Christ figure of the Old Testament. But even Moses said, there's someone else coming. So stop falling back into this Jewishness. You are with Christ now, and with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? And we get a sense that, what's the reason? Why are they falling back in? Well, maybe there's, maybe they're dealing with persecution, Maybe it's politically better at this time to be Jew instead of Christian. Well, what's the motivation? Either way, don't fall away. Don't fall back into this nation of people that didn't get it right because they can't get it right because they're sinners just like all of us. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief, a stark warning about not being able to enter the promised land because of unbelief. It's true for our world today. Unbelief is, I mean, we can talk about morality. We can list a whole bunch of problems in the world today. But the biggest problem is right there, unbelief. It doesn't mean that all believers just happy-go-lucky, wonderful, good people. But unbelief is the biggest problem in our world. Now, I speak here, though, as speaking as believers. If that's not you, you're questioning and wondering, it's okay. You're here, and you're hearing the Word of God. And that's the most powerful thing that can happen in your life. 
But for us believers, what's our wilderness? What are we wandering around in? Where's the uncertainty in our life? Is it health? Life goals? Money? Depression? Anxiety? Addictions of all kinds? A job? Or maybe there's bigger questions. Do I trust God? Can I trust God? Is He really real? Because we're all walking in some sort of wilderness. It's kind of what life is. Because even if you think you know where you're going, you don't know where you're going. In this life, at least. All right, now I get to do the balloon experiment. This is fun. Pretty good. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Alfred Hitchcock said, There is no terror in the bang, only in the anticipation of it. Like, oh, wincing a little bit. You know what movie this is? Yes. Well done. But there's no shark. Oh, yes, there is. But it's brilliant filmmaking. And it's, and it's what typically happens in a lot of different uh, suspenseful movies. In Steven Spielberg's two-hour and ten-minute classic, two hours and ten minutes, the shark appears on screen for only four minutes. The whole movie is about the shark. It's on screen for four minutes. But it's the terror that the shark is there. When you see the dangling feet of a swimmer, oh, you're looking through the shark's eyes. It creates suspense and fear. I'm going to take a moment to speak about fear. But here's what we need to know about fear. Fear is powerful, real powerful. But fear is a liar, says this song by Zach Williams. He will take your breath, stop you in your steps. Fear, he is a liar. He will rob your rest, steal your happiness, cast your fear in the fire, because fear, he is a liar. What do we fear? See, that's the wilderness we're in. What is it for you? What do you fear? The unknown? Typically, that's what it is, like the shark. We're more afraid of what might happen. What if? Rather than living in the peace and trust of our Lord. I think there's a big one that's kind of become a bit of a cultural idiom these days. I want to touch on this a little bit because I think it plays itself out, and that's FOMO, fear of missing out, if you've not heard that before. And people joke about FOMO, but I want to play this out in, in a real way. Some perhaps... Uh, Signs of FOMO that you deal with or that we deal with. Obsessively checking social media to see what others are doing. Experiencing negative feelings when comparing one's life to what others seem to be doing. Feeling down when others have fun without you. Am I hitting home at all? Worrying that friends don't like you if they do something without you. 
overwhelming yourself trying to keep up. And here's a real big one. Focusing on what you lack rather than what you have or what's wrong rather than what's right. That hits home big time. And then what do we do? What's our response? I mean, that's, that's the one above it. We overwhelm ourselves trying to maybe have the life that we're supposed to have or that culture says we're supposed to have. Remember, fear is a liar. And I especially want to grab that phrase right there. He will rob your rest. But hear these words from Isaiah. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Go ahead and say that to yourself every morning. Hear those words from the Lord, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. You're not the world's, you're mine. So when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. Or when you walk through the wilderness, I'm with you the whole way, and I am taking you somewhere. Forever, Act 3. And now we hear this word rest many times. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. They missed their rest because they were afraid. Literally, Except for Joshua and Caleb, they all missed the promised land and died in the wilderness because they were afraid. Well, what if those giants hurt us? Instead of, God said this is yours. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And understand, when we talk about this Sabbath, this seventh day of rest was not because God was tired. It's because he was done. Creation was done. The work was done. And it's a picture of the rest that we should be looking forward to. And again in this passage, he said, They shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. He attributes this psalm to David, writing about what God had said to the Israelites centuries prior. And we hear it today. If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Now we do. Maybe not in unbelief all the time, but certainly not letting him change us in the ways that he wants to change us. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. 
And now we're, it's getting back to kind of this Jewishness. Stop thinking about this earthly kingdom. Don't fall back into the idea that all of God's promises were about this promised land or this kingdom or the reestablishment of a kingdom. The rest is something else. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. What rest are we talking about here? Well, let's follow the story of Israel. Slavery in Egypt. Then there was the Exodus, rescued from that. They wandered for 40 years. But eventually they reached the promised land. We'll see the similarity for us, the parallel for everyone else. Well, including them, really. We are slaves to sin. We have been rescued by Jesus' death and resurrection. We're wandering through life. And does that describe us? I think so. In a lot of ways. But hopefully we have direction because we see where we're going, where God is taking us. And that is to heaven, eternal life. And it's not just some future thing. We have eternal life now. If you have Christ in your life, you have started your eternal life. And you will realize it fully on the last day. You have been made new. But there's a warning. That's where the warning happens. And that's where in Hebrews we hear a lot of encouragement, but there's also warnings in this book. And this is where the warning is. As we're wandering through our life, don't lose sight of who we are and where we're going. We have this in our house. It's our, we have a cross wall that just keeps growing and growing and growing, but this is at the center of it. Something we just found on the way to Branson one year. It says, live in such a way that those who know you but don't know God will come to know God because they know you. Because if we believe and our eternal life has started now, I could drop dead and I know where I'm going. Then why don't I just drop dead? Because God has a purpose for each of us. It's about the kingdom. And not the kingdom that is, but the kingdom that's meant to grow. That's why we're here. Be encouraged with these words. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest and bring some people along so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. And hear this as a blessing. There's a way to read this verse that is pretty like, could be scary. But hear it as a blessing today. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That is a blessing for us because if we're lost, go to the word. It will fix you. It has power in your life. Read your Bible. It will change you. It transforms you. And send God's word to other people. Bring them to the word. It's the best thing we can do. Because it's real. It's living. It's active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts to the soul. And it transforms the soul. And no creature is hidden from his sight. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. That's everybody. And we have the greatest weapon to rescue them with. God's word. Because someday we all stand accountable to God. Everybody will stand accountable And everyone is separated from God. No one can say, God, I deserve to be with you. But Christ is the bridge. Christ is the mediator. 
Christ is the way. Christ is the advocate. Because when we stand accountable for our sins, Christ says, they're no more. He puts his arm around us. He stands in front of us. He says, no, this person is not guilty. Because I took it. And I killed it for them. My righteousness is on them. Amen. For next week, it's a larger section, but it's about Jesus as we hear about him being a priest. So it's chapters 4 through 8.13. But again, keep in mind, next week we'll stay after for our Navigating Hebrews. So I hope you're able to join us uh, and be blessed by that. Now may the peace of God, that which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Yahweh Father, thank you for your amazing gift that we don't deserve this rest that we look forward to. And Lord, as we see that in eternity, as we wait on that glorious day when we realize our eternal life fully, we ask you, Lord, to be with us in the here and now. Keep us focused on you. Let us feel that rest now. Let us not be beaten up and beaten down by the world around us. Let us not live in fear, but in confidence in you. And through that, that others may see that hope, that joy, and that peace, and that they may desire to walk right along with us into heaven, the true promised land. In Jesus' name, amen.